There we go. Hi, everyone. I am Jennifer Hancock. I am a board member for the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And this is a program called Teaching Teachers to Teach Values. It arose out of our fellows who were starting to teach and wanted to get some information on how best to integrate ethics into their various classrooms, not necessarily just in ethics classes, but in general classes. Um, and so I've had on a variety of guests from a variety of different um, backgrounds. And today we have my good friend, Oscar Belong. Uh, and I probably just mispronounced that. Ah, anyways, <laughs> you will correct it for me. Uh, he is in the Philippines. And uh, we met a couple years ago at the uh, I'm an accelerator in Fordham, and he runs an ethics center. So Oscar, why don't you introduce yourself better than I just did, and um, we'll get going. Hello, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer, for the, uh, for the invitation. I'm very, very happy, and I'm very, very pleased uh, to be with you. Uh, well, it's in the evening here right now in Manila, so it's 10 p.m. So um, good morning to everyone, and... Uh, I, I don't suppose anyone is in Asia right now. I mean, we can, we can, this is a small group, so we can have some interaction, right? Uh, um, perhaps there, there are some of you who are in Asia. So for those who are in Asia, hello, good evening. Um, okay, so my name is Oscar Bulaong. Yeah, I'm, I'm Oscar Bulaong. And um, I teach at the Ateneo de Manila University. It's a Jesuit institution here in the Philippines. Um, I, I'm really a faculty member in a graduate school of business, but by training, I'm a philosophy major. Uh, this means that I earned my PhD, uh, my doctoral degree in philosophy in Germany. Uh, I was there from 2005 to 2009 to take my um, uh, doctoral degree. Upon returning to Manila after my doctoral degree, that's when I started getting involved uh, teaching MBA students. Before that, I had been teaching um, undergraduate philosophy courses in the, in the main campus. Our professional schools campus is in the business district. It's not in the main campus. It's, it's, uh, I think that's similar to many of the New York universities. No? Um, so in, in, the, in that particular context, about 10 years ago, maybe almost 11 years ago, uh, I needed to make a shift. I needed personally to, to share my, uh, um, my experience as a teacher of ethics. Um, I needed to make a shift from undergraduate philosophy, teaching ethics to undergraduate students to teaching professionals. So work play, this means I needed to start learning skills. I needed to develop uh, discussions and skills to hold discussions rather than to give lectures. I think you know what I mean when I, when I say that on the undergraduate level, um, students uh, expect more input and more theory. Uh, and on the, on the MBA level, on the graduate level, especially if they're workplace-based students, they expect more interaction and they expect to learn more from each other rather from the teacher. So I, that was a shock for me because I could not lecture for more than 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, that's the, the, the first experience I had teaching MBA, but then it's been 11, 10 years since then. Um, I, uh, I don't wanna talk too much about myself. I ra I'd rather um, share my experiences about teaching um, ethics. So I teach business ethics. So in that particular case, may I share, I prepared some slides. I'm gonna skip a lot of them. I'm, I'm, I, I hope that the slides will provoke you into a discussion, will be um, thought provoking enough for, uh, for a discussion and for questions and interactions later. I don't presume to be an expert. Uh, I, I really do think I'm still uh, doing a, a journey towards teaching uh, values. Um, so it's in that context, I wanted to share uh, my current, what I'm currently doing. Right now I'm teaching three cohorts of students. I'm teaching undergrad ethics, I'm teaching MBA business ethics, and another university invited me to teach a doctoral in business administration course um, for uh, doctoral students. No? 
Um, I'll skip number. I was going to go over um, each cohort to share my experiences, but I'll just go very quickly. Um, the, where the DBA course is concerned, I'll skip that. I wanted to start sharing a few things about how I teach MBA business ethics, at least, um, and then embed these insights, these experiences as a business ethics teacher uh, in, in the topic that we have now, teaching teachers to teach values. So in that context, I began earlier by saying that there's a, I, I come from a philosophy background and that basically meant that I, I'm very much equipped with theory. I can give lectures for an I could give lectures for an hour, hour and a half, but then I was forced to simplify things. Um, this is a, a diagram of uh, how I've simplified uh, an ethics theoretical, the theoretical portion of my ethics course, where I've chosen, there are five or six or seven. If you look at the textbook in business ethics, you'll, have, you'll see a variety of theoretical frameworks. I've reduced mine to three, which I think are the most uh, important. The character approach, the principled approach, and the common good approach. Like we can go back to this if you're interested to talk about the, the um points there in that diagram. But I think what I wanted to show about my growth as an MBA teacher is that I've needed to make the shift from theory to praxis. And I'm, I've added a third element because usually an applied ethics course has theory and it has praxis. I've added the third portion called intervention. And that's a very important portion now of my course because I really do believe it's important to teach stu students not just how to explain theory, how to apply it in, you know, with case studies and so on and so forth. I think it's important for students to be equipped with the tools to intervene in systems and organizations. So it's the intervention portion I, I have been focusing on the past 10 years, developing in my course. No? Um, the, this started with a book that I read a decade ago. It was a book called uh, Thinking in Systems. And then that's what got me um, to start thinking about interventions, that ethics is not just about theory. It's not just about decision making of an individual but really someone who intervenes in systems. So, um, so in this case, I usually talk about how the social sciences take up intervention. They, they say that uh, intervention can be done in two ways, structure, which has to do with uh, institution, systems, uh, social forces, as well as agency. Agency here has to do with a person, personal decision-making. Um, so these are two, at least for a framework with regard to intervention, this is how I approach uh, teaching business ethics, that intervention has to be done on a structural level to reform structure as well as to form individuals. I think um, teachers often focus on one or the other. To form individuals means that, you know, you give them uh, enough theoretical uh, background, enough skills, talk about character formation and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I think uh, equally important is the question about structure, how to intervene in um, with policy, for example, policy formulation and implementation and so on and so forth. Um, I wanted to give some examples of how, because my in my MBA course, in my MBA program, there are three, um, there are three programs that we have, um, one for the fresh graduates, the MBA standard, and one for the MBA middle managers, they're in their 30s. And the executive program is for the, the that's the course that the uh, more senior executives take. Now, I'll skip this slide and I'd rather um, show you a module learning outcome as, a, as the ethics director of the university. Um, we had to come up with module learning outcomes. So we had to construct syllabi uh, to be uh, deployed on the online platform for our courses because of the pandemic. Um, so I wanted to show you uh, that even within the MBA program, there is a way of making intervention relevant in a syllabus. Can I draw your attention just to the first line of each? So for the MBA standard, there's the verb. I think young, I mean, people who are in their 20s in the workplace need to conceptualize and explain relevant intervention strategies. 
those who are middle managers need to conceptualize and implement intervention strategies, while those who are in their executive positions need to conceptualize and lead others in implementing relevant intervention strategies. And I, I, with, with just with that twist, that 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 small twist in the verb in the verbiage for the for the syllabi. Teachers have to make adjustments with the way they present, with the way they approach our uh, teaching certain topics and so on and so forth for the different uh, programs. I hope that captures your imagination where the MBA program is concerned. Um, I, I'll devote a very, I mean, just uh, three, four minutes. I, I know I have 15 minutes, Jennifer, for the, for the inputs. I'd like to discuss, just share a few things about how I also teach the undergrad <laughs> ethics program. Again, where the theory is concerned, I've reduced them to three. Um, I wanted to capture your imagination with this particular image, this metaphor of um, that, that's given in uh, gospel. It's about uh, uh, wolves who are in sheep's clothing. Um, the way I approach, at least because most often, the way I used to teach ethics on the undergraduate level was just to give them the tools in order for them to uh, be able to make decisions in the workplace after they graduate. My experience though has been that um, students come back disillusioned. Can I repeat that? No? Students come back after graduation, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, they come back and they share. Uh, you know, thank you for teaching us the ontology. Thank you for teaching us uh, virtue ethics and so on. Those were nice. Those were ideal. But in the real world, and I know what they mean when they start talking about the real world, because in the real world, there's corruption and there's bribery, there's scandals, there's theft, and so on and so forth. So the way I've made adjustments, at least in the past few years, the way I've made adjustments to my course has been to think about how to make them better equipped for the real world. And this has been, uh, at least with, uh, I, I'm in agreement with another teacher on this, that I think we need to teach them what bad things, what unethical things people do outside. Um, and here's an example of a slide here where the case is given to students. And then um, you're, you imagine that you're a purchasing manager and it's a, it, it's a, print, it's a praxis, it's a practice that uh, purchasing managers, some purchasing managers do in the Philippines. It's called Everybody Happy, uh, where everyone conspires to uh, rig the bidding process and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details about this, but the point I'm making with this slide is that we need to teach students not just the ideals and the values, but we need to be, they, they need to be equipped and they need to know what to expect after they graduate. And especially and, and in, a, in an uh, iron, ironic moment, I tell my students that, well, I'm teaching you what bad things people do so that you, you decide if you're gonna do those bad things after you graduate. But the point is um, you, you're not, you won't be disillusioned and you're not naive in that particular case. Um, and, and it's in this context that I, well, I'll skip this. I, I, maybe we can discuss this later about character, but the image I wanted to reverse is this. This is the image I wanted to end with regarding undergraduate uh, students. Um, and it's a reverse. It's actually a subversive metaphor that I'm offering. Um, it's a sheep in wolf's clothing. And the point there is that we need to start imagining how to make our students not idealistic after they graduate, because that's what happens in, uh, I mean, at least in my experience in the Philippines. We must, uh, at least with I, I tell my uh, co-teachers, we must be more clever, no, sorry. We must teach students to be more clever and more competent than the wolf. So it's with that image that I wanted to end. I hope that that was provocative enough for us to have a conversation. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you and learning from you uh, as well. So thank you, Jennifer. That was 16 minutes. Perfect. I really like um, how you put this together and the, you know, there's two things that really stood out for me. And I'm, I'm gonna ask you to give us your slides so we can make sure we share them 
on um, on the final website that we have and also have a link to the book by Donna uh, Meadows that you mentioned. Um, the two things that stood out to me was the very first slide that had to do with, um, you know, there's the individual, there's the actions, and then there's the outcomes of the actions, and all three of those matter, right? Um, and then I think the other thing, which is, teaching ethics as an interventionary practice as opposed to just a uh, personal practice, I think would make a huge difference in, in how people are able to cope in the real world. And this isn't just in business schools. I mean, if you think back to grade school, right? You're taught, be nice to everybody, but then there's bullies, but you're not taught how to deal with the bullies and how to intervene when a bully <laughs> is bullying a friend of yours or yourself. And how would it be different if we structured these lessons on ethics as how to, as interventionist lessons? Because it's not enough to want to do good, right? You have to be able to do good. And that's not a skill that's easy, easily taught. So I'd like you to expand on that a little bit um, on this idea of teaching ethics as an interventional interventionary skill. Um, and give us a little bit of an example of that, and then we'll move on. And for people who have questions, please put them in the chat room. Thank you, Jennifer, for the question. Um, I think the question is asking about the once uh, you'd like me to give some examples about intervention tools, um, concrete tools by which students can um, uh, can bring with them after uh, class on values or ethics. Um, this is. Uh, um, I, I, I'd like to provoke, I hope I can provoke people to discuss this. In my culture, the Philippines is a collectivist culture. Um, collectivism means that the, our, we have strong social ties. Our family, our families are very important. Our self-identity, our identities are determined by uh, our place in our in society, in the family, in the in-group. Whereas other cultures, according to uh, the researchers, the U.S. is an individualist culture. Now, this is the thing. I teach whistleblowing. So one tool, one intervention strategy I think that is valuable for students is to know uh, and to know that there's not just one kind of whistleblowing. There's this article by a faculty member of Boston College. Um, his name is um, Nielsen. Um, he wrote an article. I can share the article later on, the title of the article later on. But he talks about 12 kinds of whistleblowing. I just wanted to point that out. I'm not going to discuss the 12 kinds of whistleblowing. But it points to the fact that, especially for us here in the Philippines, whistleblowing is not encouraged. Socially, it's not encouraged. We have a word to describe those who are whistleblowers. It's even worse than um, rat. I think Americans uh, call whistleblowers or uh, rats, at least how they depict it in Hollywood. Um, so it, it's in that context that I, uh, I frame the lecture on whistleblowing, that article on whistleblowing as, it doesn't have to be the scandalous kind where you go public and you reveal and then um, a mud is thrown around and your character is uh, put into question and so on and so forth. Um, that article by Nielsen describes a variety of ways by which someone can whistleblow, like uh, make an anonymous letter, for example, or talk to the boss of your boss or and several others. I just, I, I hope by, by evoking, invoking the name, the number 12, it captures your imagination and think, oh my God, there are 12 kinds, there are 12 ways to whistle blow and the scandalous kind is not the only one. It, I think it equips students to think of, um, uh, of calling truth to power. Uh, there are different tools, there are different ways. And then it requires a certain wisdom in order to know which kind of whistleblowing to use. Uh, in the right, in the appropriate set of circumstances. So I, I hope with that particular, um, with that particular detail, intervention in in a scenario. You, you use the example of bullying, Jennifer, but um, in a workplace scenario, for example, in an academic setting, um, we witness very often misbehavior, and in my culture, we keep quiet. 
Um, I wanted to th ask that for, for, for those in another culture. When you witness, uh, how, how can you embed whistleblowing, for example, in, an, in a values class, in an ethics class? How do you encourage uh, victims of bullying to speak out and so on and so forth? I hope that was um, sufficient. Yeah, it was. It was a really great example um, of 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 the the idea of intervention as a, uh, a lens to view ethical behavior through. Um, so Charlie Yang asked, um, "Do you have a sense of beauty? A sense that beauty is also in the realm of values? And do you have any suggestions for incorporating beauty or aesthetics in management education, including business ethics or sustainability courses?" Charlie, hi. I'm glad. I'm glad you're asking the question. Is it okay, um, Jennifer, if we uh, we can have a conversation, right? Or is this just? Um, I muted myself. Oh, you're um, muted. It's actually it it helps streamline things. If, if if you know he can ask a follow up, but it, it streamlines things and helps make sure everybody gets their questions answered. If we do it this way, so yeah. Okay. 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 Great. Okay. Hi, Charlie. Thank you for the question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, there are many ways to um, embed beauty in uh, an ethics class, when we teach values especially. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll be very concrete. Um, I'll, I'll use an example from my father in this context. Um, long, long ago, I remember when I was a teenager, I was asking for permission to do something that was not uh, that was typical of teenage boys, but are not um, really socially acceptable. I won't say what, doesn't matter what what was. But I remember what he said, and it, it struck me. He said, um, can I say it in Tagalog? Just to get a feel of the... He, he said it, um, so I was asking, Dad, can I do this? And, and I'd like to do this with my friends. And then he said, um, hindi ata maganda tignan niyan. Hindi ata maganda tignan niyan. He said, in lit in literally translated, that means that doesn't look good. That, that's, that doesn't look good uh, to look at, literally. No, it's not good to look at. Um, so the action, I think, there was evoking uh, beauty, not beauty, the right thing, the right action as something beautiful, as something aesthetically pleasing, as something harmonious. And uh, the unethical thing, the wrong thing, as something ugly. I think that's very important in our culture today, especially because we're social creatures. We need, I, I think it's uh, important for us to, us to I, I'll be concrete. Um, Corruption. There was a corruption study in the in government just recently. It doesn't matter the article when it was released, but there was a study about the acceptability of corruption in local government units in the Philippines. There was a study on local government units about how acceptable, how people felt, and on a Likert scale, they said it's acceptable. And um, there were conflict of interest uh, issues that they basically said that it's okay to, you know, to that's okay to receive money, for example, on top of the, uh, um, and, and also to receive gifts from uh, suppliers and so on and so forth. Um, it's not ugly. And, and because it was acceptable, um, I think that's the, one of the reasons why it's rampant. And because we're socially, uh, socially conditioned creatures, it would be wonderful if, and I've seen this in other cultures where, um, where it's simply ugly to receive, where people have to hide to do bad things, where people have to, um, and, and, and that's one of the things that we can intervene in and, and basically to say, that's ugly, you know, that action is ugly. And, and I think that can be, and, and, and often maybe just uh, facial reactions can, can really reveal a lot about how we think th there are actions that are ugly and beautiful. With a grimace, for example, or, or re repulsion at something. So um, um, I hope, Charlie, that I'm not sure if we're on the same wavelength. Please ask, uh, please go ahead and uh, make a follow-up question if, if, if 
um, I'm answering on a different. Um, no, I, you know, I personally there. found that very, very helpful. As you were talking, I was thinking about the soccer game I watched last night and how yeah. ugly one of the teams played and they lost badly because they were playing ugly as opposed to the winning team, yeah. which was playing with joy and beauty. And, you know, and I, I keep, as I watch these things, I think this is such a good metaphor for how businesses should be operating because the Absolutely. ugly play is not good play, right? Um, next question, and, and Charlie, if you have a follow-up question, um, you know, we'll get to it. Toller asks, I have student works, work in teams and invariably social loafing arises from one student. How might you try to create a condition where everyone takes responsibility? I have them set, a team charter and expectation and that seems to assist thoughts yeah um um sorry uh i i understand the question but i'm interested to know i have something to learn about what team charter is jennifer could you explain what team charter is? um i think toller you will need to unmute yourself to answer that question for him hi there oscar and uh, jennifer um so Thanks. um what I have them do is like create a, it's almost like a behavior uh, expectations chart um, to like what's acceptable on our team. Because um, now I, I've been teaching for over 15 years to teams and it, it seems like I learn more about the teams than maybe some of the students do, but, but you know, yeah, I, yeah. it's, it's always ends up being like, you want to teach them some kind of moral responsibility, um, but it's very difficult when there's one person, uh, or sometimes it's two. But but you know there's might be a team of four, but there's one person who's not doing their share. So I'm finding that if they have some kind of expectations beforehand, that helps. But um, you know especially doing interventions with moral responsibility. I just wanted to hear some things that you've done successfully with with classes and maybe you know collaborative teams in your classes thank you yeah color wonderful question can yeah, i rob, can i can rob, i answer it rob sorry Robert? yes rob. hi rob Robert. thanks yeah great um can i look i can i approach the question from the the the, the framework that i was offering in my in my input slate uh, earlier structurally and from an uh, agency perspective. Um, I have observed that it is also important how I design uh, group work. It's very important how I design group work because I, I often think that, oh, I just, you know, I just throw them some work and then think that, you know, I mean, even structurally, how many, how many people are in the group, uh, the nature of the output, uh, the deadlines, the, uh, the even the assessment, the ways of assessing the group work, I think had to be structured in a way that encourages teamwork. I I know this because I've made the mistake of uh, I'll just be straight, straight to the point of assigning a very simple um, one a two page paper to six people with a three day deadline. I made a mistake many years ago. Two pages cannot be written by six people. Um, and the, 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 the deadline was three days, four days, or a week. That's too short for people to actually stop and collaborate. So I think the design structurally of the group work really encourages loafing because, um, of course, one or two people will have to take initiative and will have to go deep into answering the question. So from a design and structural perspective, I want to say that I think it's a teacher's responsibility to think about um, uh, how a, a group project will encourage collaboration. That's one. From an uh, age, from the agency perspective, I've also, at least from an agency perspective, I've tried peer review. I'm not sure if that's charter, if that, that's what team charter means, but for um, peer, I, oh, okay, concrete example. I once reviewed the syllabus from a different department, okay? And the, there was, they had peer review. So there were five people. The, the syllabus was structured in this way. Um, five people in a group. And then each of them will give a grade to the other four members. 
And then if your grade, there was, it was the, the rubrics were there. If your grade is lower than um, X, your final mark goes down one grade point. If your, and so on and so forth. I think you know how that was designed. So it was, um, it was designed in a way that uh, their peer review had an effect on um, their final marks. Um, I asked a year after if the teacher was still implementing that and the teacher said no, because um, the teacher had several, after the first semester, there were several cases of students complaining to the dean officially. And then uh, an ad hoc committee had to be because one student claimed that he was not loafing and the other students were. And, and that had real implications because someone could not graduate because their teach their um, group mates graded did not like him or did not like her. Um, I wanted to show the other extreme of how structural interventions can also have a bad effect. Um, I'm not saying that that system may not, will not or may not work, uh, but it did not work for this particular class, for this particular department. Um, from an agency perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll be candid about my, my position on that. I have I, from an agency perspective, I just tell the students, uh, I don't do peer review. I don't check if anyone is loafing. I, I basically just give, I think that's what you mean by charter, gi uh, giving them uh, their own autonomy to determine how they want to do the work and for them to articulate how they will divide the work and so on and so forth. So to be at least, are explicit in how, how they, and then I suppose giving them a lot of autonomy as well for grading. I, I don't know if that can structurally be done um, to grade their own and then compare that with your grade and so on and so forth. I mean, there's, there, I don't know if there's a way of um, tweaking that system, but I've, to be honest, I, Rob, I've um, abandoned the, stru uh, the structural and I just tell my students, just please, this is interesting. This is an interesting project. Um, I hope you can devote the time for this, support each other. And um, what I do instead is a buddy system in the group. So there are usually even numbers, four or six per group, depending on the, the project. And then um, there's a buddy system. So they have to uh, uh, watch out, for, watch each other's backs, basically. Um, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I hope that kind of captures the imagination with how to intervene there. So the, the question I had is it seems like a perfect opportunity to introduce the concept of um, one of the learning objectives of the thing is how do you intervene ethically when you have a loafer, right? If, if intervention is one of the things you want them to learn, right, is, is making that an explicit part of the project. <laughs> To creatively and ethically figure out how to help the team all participate, you know. Okay. Anyways, uh, next question. <laughs> Facil uh, Ricardo Flores says facilitating a learning process with an outcome of learning to do good is definitely something we can do more. However, for the good of society and ourselves, we should we simply give up on helping others to becoming better and more moral intervention individuals? Should we give up on helping others to become better and more moral in individuals. So should we focus on ourselves and give up on others, yeah. I guess is the question. And um, Ricardo, I don't know if you want to in unmute if I got it, the question wrong. <laughs> no, my question was, thank you. Sorry, sorry, apparently I couldn't, I couldn't create the no, question explain. clearly enough. Uh, but uh, the question is, the, the focus has been on learning to do good, which again, I think is perfectly okay. But I'm worried that we are giving up. We are not doing enough on helping to becoming better, becoming good, uh, to be more moral individual people. And, and so moral development of our students is something that we are giving up on and I'm concerned about that. Yeah, 
Um, Ricardo, I completely I understand the question. I, I like the question because, um, and I agree with the way it was formulated that there's a distinction between uh, learning to do the good um, and learning um, to do things for the common good. I think if we can depict it that way, um, just learning to be good, which is inward, reflexive, and then there's learning to do the uh, learning to do the for the common good, something for the common good. So it's outward, uh, it's an outward movement rather. So I, I like the tension between the centrifugal and the centripetal forces there, um, and that's why that's why on a from a theoretical level, I agree that we can make the distinction. Um, and many philosophers will uh, uh, will talk about a variety of um, uh, of that distinction between the individual and society, and so on and so forth. Um, but if I can get straight to the point of my opinion, uh, what I think about that distinction is that I think on a theoretical level we can make the distinction, but I think on a very practical level, I think the two are dynamically linked. Um, I don't think one is possible without the other. I don't think becoming more moral is possible as a monologue, as an internal, um, as a genuinely internal phenomenon that I go to one corner of my room and I can do, uh, you know, develop virtues uh, when, where I can talk about um, how I can, um, you know, uh, do how I'm, uh, follow the law the, the, from a deontological, I mean, whatever theory. I, 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 do, I won't dabble into the theory there. But the point I wanted to make is I think for someone who is becoming better, a better person, automatically, I, and, and I cannot remove it from, that's why I keep saying, and maybe I'm revealing my culture here. Being in a collectivist culture, it's uh, I I feel very much how embedded I am in my family, in my community, in the, the people around me, and how we interact and how we affect each other. So that I I can from a from a philosopher philosopher's point of view stay in my ivory tower using the cliche of ivory tower and imagine myself becoming more virtuous, becoming more moral. But uh, in the real world, I don't think, and I'm using the expression of, of workplace based student, in the real world, becoming more moral requires that, centri that centrifugal force out outward, um, where it, the interaction with other people is so important. Um, Jennifer, can I just two more minutes for this particular question? I, I was reviewing, I was reviewing, I saw the article that I read some years ago. Again, there was this Harvard study. There was this Harvard study, one of the long standing, no, no, I think they stopped already. There's a, uh, there was a, a, about a five, six or seven decade study they did in Harvard from the 30s or 40s up until last decade. And it was a happiness study. It, it, I, 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 it's available online, just Harvard Happiness Study. And they um, correlated a variety, they, they, they observed, interviewed, and followed the lives of 600 uh, people in the US. I think 300 from Boston, 300 from New York. They followed the lives of 600 people, men, sorry, that was in the 30s or 40s. So they followed 600 men. Um, they interviewed about career, about um, relationships, about um, salary, health. They mod monitored uh, hypertension, how frequently people got colds, how, how frequently people got sick. And there was one, I mean, and, and I, uh, uh, it's, it was a, it's an enriching study to read because there was only one thing that correlated with happiness, with self-reported happiness. And it wasn't salary, obviously, it wasn't. I mean, it, it can be predicted easily that it wasn't salary. Just because of higher salary doesn't mean higher self-reported happiness. Um, career also, or it, um, the, it was uh, intimate relationships, not quantity, 
not how many intimate relationships you have, but just one or two. And the quality, it was the quality of the relationships uh, that determined self-reported happiness. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think if we can identify flourishing, which is, um, which is flourishing and dignity and what it means to be human, genuinely human, we can associate this and embed it in uh, humanistic management. Um, I think uh, w the study reveals just how important our relationships are. So can there now, just right now, can there be an Asian um, holding up the flag of collectivism and saying, hey, um, our, our, our intimate relationships, our close relationships determine our flourishing, our happiness. Um, and that's very clear, like, that can clearly be uh, linked with ethics, with morality. Doing good means not just going inward, becoming a perfect moral person. That requires an outward uh, reaching out to people for the common good and society. I hope that was nice. I hope that was good. Yeah. Can I, I want to follow up on this, this conversation because um, there's, there were several questions in the, when people registered that had to do with how do we teach ethics in a multicultural environment and also how do we teach with cultural humility while also providing cultural validation to the various cultures. And I think as I've been listening to you, you've been very clear about um, self-identifying your culture, but also in a way that's very hu humble. And so I'd like you to kind of I, address that in the context of what you're just talking about is how do we do this? Because I think this is one of the things that scares people when they start trying to introduce ethics and values in say a strategy class or a writing class or whatever class it is, yeah. is how do we yeah. introduce yeah. the values in a way that's culturally humble in a multicultural setting? So please. Thank you, Jennifer, yeah. Um, so I, I, I will always cite some article uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, get, I started teaching to my MBA students, um, uh, this researcher, um, this Dutch researcher named Gert Hofstede. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name correctly, Hofstede or Hofstede. Um, he did a cross-cultural study and identified several um, di cultural dimensions. It's strange, uh, it's, well, at the beginning, I, students found it strange why I was teaching culture, multiculturalism and uh, uh, the cultural dimensions in an ethics class. But I kept insisting that you need to learn how to navigate difference. And that was very simple. That was a simple insight I wanted to bring up. You need to be able to navigate difference well, effectively. And, and by difference, I mean, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm evoking uh, some philosophers from before. I won't mention it, it does not matter who they are. Um, but several philosophers after World War II identified a very basic impulse in human interaction. And that was um, uniformity. The, the, the tendency of the, human, uh, of the human in a social interaction is to reduce the other to myself. And we do this very often, very practically and concretely when we give advice. We usually give advice based on our self-referential um, experience and when also oh, you're having this problem with your ex, your, with your whoever your boss your uh, sibling your etc cetera, etc cetera. oh when i this is what i did and this is what you should do um there's a tendency to reduce the other into sameness i don't say this in the class but it's in that in the spirit of um breaking and undermining that impulse and to always think of difference, to always approach people as different. Alterity is the fancy term, that they are not me. It's a very simple, very basic impulse, I think. And um, uh, I think that's an important value to teach. Uh, because uh, if, I mean, without, without recalling fascism or any other particular um, 
part of you know human history it, it was always from the perspective the, the unethical behavior of war and and and, and um, was always from the perspective of sameness you need to be like us or if you cannot be then we annihilate you um it's in that insight that I think alterity and difference is such a basic ethical value. Um, and so that's why I, I think it's important that in, in that's embedded in a discussion about culture and to how to navigate culture then when we take up the cultural dimensions of Hofstede. Um, that's when we start talking about feminist and feminism and uh, masculinity, um, uh, the difference between low um low power distance and high power distance uh about manageability or fatalism these are these are basic impulses across cultures the japanese have this impulse um and people often worry that aren't you teaching stereotyping and perpetuating stereotypes when you use hochstede um I approach it differently, and I kept I keep insisting on that point that we don't do we're not learning the cultural dimensions in order to stereotype, but to understand difference, to understand ourselves, and to un understand difference. Um, I'm hoping that's 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 important. So I'm not sure, Jennifer, if it's so much humility, but more of a simple coming to terms with the fact that I cannot that that I cannot impose sameness on others no it was that was a i'm so glad you went into that um so uh german otalar otalar laura i'm so bad at that said teaching ethics to architecture students you have to differentiate between goodness and beauty it was just a comment i'm going to move on to michael's question have you heard of pro-social evolutionary principles using the core design principles of eleanor ostrom um and how it helps with team culture no i'd like to learn michael i'd like to learn that if you don't mind i'd like to hear about um, eleanor Osh. i've heard about but um i'm not familiar with ben mentioned it i we weren't able to discuss it at length yeah I can, is that okay I can, we we had a couple of sessions with david sloan wilson who was telling that and we're teaching that right now so I, I can I can give some more insight on that, but yeah, yeah that we'll maybe have something to, to check out. We'll have to do it at a different time. We have about 10 minutes left and we have a couple more questions. So um, let's move on. Tanisha Taylor says social loafing, regarding the social loafing discussion, um, she appreciates the primary focus on communicating expectations and considering the relevance and rigor of the task. When we are satisfied with the quality of the aforementioned, then we consider the ethics of social loafing. And um, and then she follows up on the cultural conversation. Overemphasis on sameness in schools leads to cultural erasure and invalidation, especially for groups that are already marginalized. So any <laughs> thoughts? Um, is it okay double thumbs up? Double thumbs up. Um, and then Michael says, "How um, I'll I'll uh, you're gonna have to say it. I'm that's because I have to look it up. Okay. It's a new word okay. for me. <laughs> alterity, uh, alterity, um, and others connecting. Um, othering is often unethical. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so we have about ten minutes left. Um, Oscar." I muted myself in mid-sentence. Um, is there anything else you want to, you know, based on the conversation we've just had, is there anything else you want to tell us that you feel like you might have forgotten about ways that teachers can integrate ethics in classes other than ethics, right? You, you teach specifically an ethics class. Part of what we're hoping will happen through the International Humanistic Management Association is the inner of ethics in all of the business classes and not just a standalone ethics class. So do you have any advice for teachers who are teaching maybe strategy or accounting or whatever the topic is um, on how they might integrate ethics into their particular classroom given that it's not the central topic of their class? Yeah, um, thank you for that, Jennifer. I, I, 
it actually puts me on the spot. The question puts me on the spot because um, remember, well, my undergrad degree was management, um, but I, okay, uh, to be concrete, I want to listen more rather than give advice. I want to listen more to accounting teachers, to strategy teachers, to um, finance teachers, and so on and so forth. And actually, we've been doing it the past year. Um, so in my undergraduate business school, um, I'm in a committee now, and we're working towards integrating and embedding ethics in the, in the different functional areas. And uh, I recognize that uh, this is what ethics teachers usually do in that scenario. So if, if we can be, you know, um, this is a, um, ethics teachers usually go in and then start telling them that, you know, you, you should do this in accounting, you should tell them about transparency, how, how financial statements should be transparent. Uh, and, and in marketing, you should um, uh, give the proper information to, uh, product information to your consumers because and so on and so forth because it harms um and and that alienates functional area teachers i think so i'm very careful about that and uh, uh in my experience what's the what's been most useful in the work that i'm doing with the undergraduate business school is developing is the discovery that we need to develop learning materials First, they don't need conversion. Business ethics teachers, ethics teachers usually think, oh, those accounting teachers, they're unethical. Oh, those strategy teachers, all they want to do is earn profit. And uh, you know, they, they're, they're still uh, duped by the neoliberal agenda and so on and so forth. And ethics teachers go in and think that they need to convert them. My discovery personally was, I was preaching to the choir. I was preaching to the choir simply because I, I did not need to convert. I needed to work together and collaborate to develop learning materials. Because when we sat down and we I candidly had the conversation outside of a meeting room, but informally, they expressed collectively, we just need cases. We need one page handouts. We need... Um, learning materials we need to be able to teach these things so can we please sit down and uh develop the cases write the cases and um let's make the powerpoint presentations and can you take a look at my syllabus and we can work on the syllabus together we start can i point that out that i think it's an important at least um i think it's an important uh value to have to know when you need to be in conversion mode, in a conversion mode, missionary conversion mode, versus um, recognizing preaching to the choir and you need to be in a collaborative mode instead. And I found that, um, I found a lot of um, like-minded people in, in our group in, in humanistic management. And we're working towards that with other universities here in the Philippines no? to collaborate on those things but with that recognition that we don't need to convert there are many people who really just uh, who, who want to teach ethics in their courses but don't know how um i hope i don't know if i answer the question because i'm not giving advice i'm basically giving advice to me to myself I, i'm not sure maybe if you're dealing with a business ethic with an ethics teacher as a functional area teacher you can tell them me you don't need to convert us you're preaching to the choir and so on and so forth. no i thought i thought it was a very helpful answer so um i think one last question is from yores kiata jata it would be achievable if in every course teachers talk about power and politics being clear on for whom something is ethical and who decides on this label especially on its enforcement the implications of behavior that is considered unethical and under what circumstances. So thoughts and comments on that. And I think we have five minutes, so let's let that be the last uh, question. Can I just give um, two thumbs up for that as well, Jennifer? So I agree uh, uh, that uh, power and politics are important to discuss uh, because idealism is not something that, uh, that idealism was, was student, causes students to become disillusioned after they graduate. 
Perfect. And I think Teresa McNichol says, is the moral imagination ever emphasized as the approach to rehearsing ethical actions and reflection before putting into action? I love, I love someone um, brought in moral imagination. Um, can I end with this point, uh, with a provocative question? Um, I, 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 I was asked to teach another course in philosophy. The topic is religion. And I had a discussion with someone from Eastern Europe in a, in a different context where um, someone said that it doesn't matter where or who, um, but someone said that, you know what, religion is not something that's automatic for a person. Um, you know, this, this seeking, this what you call this uh, ontological thirst for, um, for a grand narrative, that there are people who simply do not um, seek out any grand narrative or any meaning. Uh, and they use the metaphor of um, um, when you cannot carry a tune, how, what do you call that? You don't call that sound deafness, you call that musical. When someone cannot carry a tune, Jennifer, what do you call that? They're tone deaf. Tone deaf. I was looking for the word tone deaf. Um, I, I, I wanted to bring up that question and, 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 and ask that about morality. Are there people who are simply tone deaf to morality? Or do we have some innate natural um, normative desire for to change things for the better, to, to improve things? Because I think ultimately what, what uh, yeah, I agree, Michael, uh, Michael psychopaths. Um, but that's, that's um, I'm thinking that's an illness. Um, and I, I'm thinking if, it, if it's possible for it not to be an illness and to simply just be tone deaf to it. It's an interesting question for me to think about because uh, in so far as it's not uh, an illness. Um, because otherwise, because the implication for me is this, if it's innate, if it's natural, then as teachers, who teach values, we simply have to evoke that tonality of ethics. We simply have to evoke the, the, that it's something innate, intuitive, natural for us. And um, we need to be musical, open close quotes, ethically musical in that. And I love the, I love the term moral imagination in, in that particular context because um, if we can begin a course with that, uh, with evoking that tonality of morality, of values, of character formation, of dignity, all these principles of the common good, which are innate and natural, I don't think we'll have problems um, with our with teaching students. We we stop trying to convert them, and we start we stop preaching to the choir, and we start finding like-minded uh, individuals who, with whom we can intervene. So I wanted to end with that, with one minute. As okay. a teacher, as an ethics teacher, I wanted to end with a point. Uh, I think my, and, and I'm just articulating it for the first time now, thanks to our, our, our conversation. I think the, one of the, my most uh, significant um, developments as an ethics teacher is I've learned to stop converting and to, to start collaborating with fellow faculty, with students, with um, people like you, with Ima, with, with uh, other people from universities. So we stop thinking in terms of tribes or them in group and out, so on and so forth. But now as um, finding like-minded people. I hope that's, that helps. Perfect. It was really, I really enjoyed this. I thought the conversation was great and the questions were great. So thank you very much. Uh, just a quick reminder, this has been a program of the International Humanistic Management Association. If you're not yet a member, please join. Um, we have tomorrow, we have a lunch and learn uh, scheduled and then there's events also coming up. So go to the website, um, humanisticmanagement.international and you can find our event list and all that's there. Thank you very much.